Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Photography Tips and Tricks, your show for gear, tips, inspiration, anything that you need to take your photography to the next level. My name is RC, and this is the season finale. So I've pulled in Mr. Pete Collins and Brad Moore to give us a bunch of different tips. I'm not gonna waste any time. First up, we have Mr. Pete Collins talking to us a little bit about panning and how to use that to be able to create dramatic pictures. Pete, what do you have for us today? Well, I'm gonna tell you about panning, but I wanna share one little tip with you. If you're a sports shooter, what's gonna help your shooting? And that's these little babies right here. If you don't have a pair of good knee pads, these are gonna save your life because you're gonna get lower, you're gonna be able to do shots that you don't have before and not kill your knees. Make sure you get some gel inserts in your knee pads. Save your life if you're a sports shooter. That's a little side tip. All right, I wanna to talk to you about painting. Painting is really an art form because what you're trying to do is you're trying to show motion through a still photograph. And the only way you're gonna be able to do that is you're gonna be able to have to introduce some blur into your picture. Well, how do you do it? You've got an object going across, a race car, a football player, a ballerina, whatever. If you're gonna pan on them, you're gonna to have to learn a few techniques to be able to get that subject crisp and clear and have the background have a nice creamy motion to it. Let's take a look at a couple images. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If we go to the first image, here we have a car sitting on a track. And if you were to look at this car, you go, boy, that's a nice shot of that car parked on the track. Well, the truth of the matter is that car is going about 70, 80 miles an hour, but because of my shutter speed, I have frozen that car right on the track. There's nothing exciting about that. However, if we switch to the next picture, I have now panned the background and you can see the spin of the wheels, the blur of the background, it's given that drama to it. Because let's face it, once you've taken a picture of a car once or twice, it looks like a car. So the way you're gonna add that emphasis and that excitement is to be able to create that drama in the background. So let me show you what a couple things you need to think about when you're panning. First off, you're gonna wanna set your camera so that you have a slower shutter speed. You're gonna slow down your shutter speed. Probably a good place to start is at uh, 125th of a second, somewhere around there. You might need to go up or down a little bit according to how you hold your camera and how steady you are. But that's a good place to start. Now when you aim your camera, you're gonna want to not try to flick like this, but you're really gonna wanna hold steady on whatever your subject is and rotate with your hips. This is gonna take some practice. Whenever I'm going out and I know I'm gonna be panning, I try to get there early and practice on cars, practice on whatever I'm doing, and get kind of a rhythm in there. Once you understand what it takes, you're gonna be able to take lock on a subject, and as it goes by, start clicking the shutter having a slower shutter speed with an automatic focusing on the subject that changes as it goes, as it's moving, continuous focus. And you're gonna be able to snap away as you go across and it's gonna get one or two of those in that panning shot that are gonna be crisp on the object and have a nice creamy blur in the background. So just remember, you're gonna to wanna to practice, you wanna keep everything locked in and you're gonna to wanna to use your hips more than you think to get a nice creamy pan across the shot. All right, so let's just get a quick review here real quick before we do any of that stuff. So you're saying you want to be able to shoot this with 125th, 125 or a 25th of a second? 125th of a second is a good place to start. Okay. There, are, there are actually a couple things that are coming to play with this. How fast is the object coming across? You want to make sure you're perpendicular to the object because any other angle is going to look a little weird but you're gonna to wanna to slow down the shutter speed so that you can give the sense of motion, but still retain clarity. All right, so I, this would be something that you can do with like shutter priority mode? Are you shooting in yes, shutter priority? Yes, I'm shooting in shutter priority okay. mode. Or if I know that my light's gonna stay consistent, I'll go to manual and be able to keep that so I'm not thinking about anything else and hopefully getting some quicker, faster response time with my camera. All right. One, one last thing, if we go to the next picture here, we've got two more pictures to show you. Here we have that same type of situation here. You see how when I haven't panned on the person, he looks frozen. When I go to the next one, you see how the road and everything is giving you that impression of movement. Now this is gonna change according to your focal length of your camera as well. If you've got a longer focal length, even the slightest movement is gonna give you an increased blur for your background. But the problem is it's gonna give you more blur on your subject. So if you're gonna have a larger lens that you're using to try to pan, you're gonna to have to use some special techniques. And RC's gonna talk about that in just a second. Oh, awesome, and one of the things that you can't 
argue with is the introduction of just nice drama when you're working with this. Taking that subject and moving that subject along the frame and having that kind of blur just introduces a wonderful set of action there. Thanks so much, Pete, for that. Absolutely essential technique if you're doing any kind of sports photography, you want to do motion. Now, before we go to a break, I did want to talk about something. I just got back from Vegas. We're at the WPPI conference, and somebody was asking me specifically about working with Canon cameras and doing bracketing. And I talked about this in an earlier lesson, you know, in an earlier episode of Tips and Tricks. We were talking about the concept of the fact that the Canon cameras do bracketing of just a maximum of three. So I wanted to take you through this real quick. When you're working with your Canon camera, what will happen is this. You'll have a menu, and inside of the menu, you have this option where you can select your exposure bracketing and the amount of pictures that it takes. So we'll go ahead and we'll take a look here. Inside of this section here, we have the exposure compensation and bracketing. So this is the section that I'm going to want. Obviously, I'm set to aperture priority mode right now. I'm going to select this section. Now, inside of this, I'm using the 5D Mark III with a 24 to 70 lens. You'll notice that if I move my top selector here, I have the option of setting an underexposed shot, a metered shot, and an overexposed shot. And right now I have it set to one stop of difference. One of the things that I like now about these cameras is that you can go to two stops. You can even take it even further and go to three stops. So you can go out and make an HDR shot, or you can take a shot that's bracketed that sits in this one range, right? So it gives you three stops under, metered, three stops over. But sometimes you're going to want to be able to get more, seven, nine frames, and you're going to want them to be about a stop apart to do some work. Well, how would we do it here? So in this instance, what I would recommend, since you only have three, it's a little kludgy, but this will work. I would set yourself up to have it at around one stop of exposure. You're taking the three shots, but here's the deal. Once you're here, grab the back selector, and in the back selector, if you move this, to the left or to the right, you can see that you can slide that bracket around the frame. So now you're underexposing this and it's taking those metered shots. What I would do is I would bring this all the way to minus three. Now you're taking four stops under, three stops under, two stops under. Take that bracketed series. Come back in here, switch it to zero. Now you're taking one, zero, and plus one. Then come over here, bring it to plus three, Take that bracketed series, and now you're taking plus two, plus three, plus four. So it's something that takes a little bit of kind of finagling when you're in there, but if you need to be able to get that and you want to get nine shots with one stop of exposure, it's the easiest way to do it. Now, let's do this. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we have Mr. Brad Moore talking to us about focusing, and I'm bringing on some big lenses. Stick around. Welcome back everybody for Photography Tips and Tricks RC here. Now we have Mr. Brad Moore talking to us about focusing, who's gonna solve a very important problem for you. Brad, what do you got for us, man? Well, have you ever been trying to take a picture and you're having this issue with the, the lens just won't focus? Well, lenses have minimum focusing distances, which means you can only get so close to something 
before the lens can't focus anymore. So like the 70 to 200 here, its minimum focusing distance is around four and a half feet. So if you're doing a portrait shoot and you're trying to get in really close to the, to the model or your subject, and you're sitting there and it's just focusing, 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 and never locking on, that's because you're too close. You gotta take a step back. This uh, 16 to 35 on the Canon side, its minimum focusing distance is like 11 inches. So you can get something about this close, or however far our foot is, uh, to the lens, and it'll still focus, where this has to be four feet out. There's also, with macro lenses, you can get like a 100 or a 105 macro, and you can get something a foot away from the lens and it'll still focus. So that's the difference between a regular like 70 to 200 lens and a macro lens. So that, that extra focusing distance lets you get that much closer to, to the subject and still be able to focus. So that's just something you wanna take into consideration when you're looking at different lenses and you know, just think about what you're shooting, how close you need to get to your subject, and then look at the different types of lenses there are. And a lot of the times, we have a lot of people that ask questions when we're on seminars and doing these kinds of things that, that's the classic problem. It's like you're looking at it and you're like, zzz, 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 what, what's going on? And it's one of those things that you don't think about, that each of these lenses does have that minimum distance, and you need to know what that distance is when you're working with that. Thanks so much, Yeah, Brad. no problem. That's awesome. Now listen, I'm gonna bring out the big lenses because we're talking about panning and I've got kind of Pete helping me out here to grab some stuff because I didn't want to necessarily touch anything and drop it while I was talking to you guys about it. But we talked about the concept of panning and working with most of that stuff and you'll see a lot of people doing that on things like 70 to 200s. But a lot of the times if you're working in sports photography, you start working with bigger lenses. And if you're working on landscapes, you start talking with things like gimbals. So I wanted to make sure that we talked a little bit about that and how to be able to work with it. So Pete's handing me here a 400 millimeter lens. This is a huge lens to work, right, for any kind of sports stuff. Look, that's my arm, right? It's a very, very big, very, very heavy lens, but when you're working in any kind of sports photography stuff, this is absolutely essential for you to work with. So a lot of the times when you set up a lens like this, you're setting it up usually on a monopod, which allows you to be able to kind of do this. You could set yourself up. Now, I'm not putting a camera on it just yet, but I would have my hand on the camera over here, and I would spin from one point to another point, right? So I can do this pivot to be able to do what I want, find the shots that I want, right? So this is something that you can employ when you're working with bigger lenses. It's a little hard. You wouldn't be necessarily doing this holding it really tight to yourself because this is something that would be extremely hard for you to keep steady. At 400 millimeters too, you're gonna to be doing a shutter speed of about 400 if you wanted to be able to get a tack sharp shot. If you wanted to be able to drag, as Pete talked to you about, it would be very, very heavy. So a lot of the times what you'll see in something like this is you'll see it usually strapped directly onto a monopod. There's no ball head, there's nothing there. It gets screwed directly onto the monopod. Now, what'll happen with this though, is a lot of the times if you're doing side to side motion, that's pretty easy, right? Pretty straightforward. But what'll happen is sometimes you'll try to get this and you don't have a lot of forward and backward motion, right? You can get low when you're working with it. I wouldn't recommend it. I've actually seen people turn around and do this, right? And it's basically, there's a rubber leg at the very, very bottom of this, and I've seen people kind of trip it out, lens comes crashing down. So not necessarily the best thing. So in instances where you need to be able to have a little bit of kind of moving upwards and downwards, what you want to do is you want to be able to employ something called a gimbal. And what a gimbal does, is it sets yourself up so that you can have the lens in a position where it sits balanced against your camera and against the tripod that we're using. Now, just geek out moment. So I'm using the GT5562 LTS by Gitzo, and I'm using a really right stuff pano gimbal head. So what would happen here is this. You would have your camera attached to this, and you'll notice that there's a couple of knobs in this one section. So you have a knob here at the top, and you'll have a knob here at the right. This knob, once you let this go, would let you go in these directions, right? You take this knob right here, and when you open this, this knob would let you go up and down. So if you're doing any kind of wildlife shooting, this would be something that would be really, really good because you could leave these relatively loose and you can move around and get to the shot that you want. Now, when you have a camera attached to this with a much longer lens, what would happen is you would want to balance this so that the lens sits balanced with the camera, and when you let this go a little bit, it evens itself out and doesn't move. 
so it'll actually feel very, very fluid for you to move around. With a really, really big lens, you want that kind of support. You want a really big, beefy body. You want a gimbal to be able to stabilize you and get all of that motion around and not necessarily have to carry something like this. Now, this begs the question, how many of you guys are gonna have big lenses? How many of you guys are gonna own 400s? Obviously we have them here because we do a lot of work with that stuff here, but this is something that you would rent, right? This isn't something that you necessarily have to buy. What I would recommend for you is go to a company like Borrow Lenses, right? www.borrowlenses.com. You can go to the Borrow Lenses site and in there you can rent all of this gear. So if you're out doing a shoot, you wanna go do some sports photography, you wanna do some landscapes, you wanna get some wildlife, that's the place for you to be able to go. You can get the lens, you can get gimbal kits, and you can get all of this stuff set up. If you wanna take a look at that, make sure you take a look at borrowlenses.com. They have all of that stuff for you. Now, let's do this. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, I've got a website to watch, and we're giving away something big. Stick around. Welcome back everybody, RC here, Photography Tips and Tricks. Now, I wanna leave you with a website for the end of the season. I want you to go to joebusink.com. Joe Busink is a Beverly Hills photographer who has some wonderful imagery for weddings. So he's shot, I think, he shot for Annie Leibovitz. He's shot so many celebrity weddings, but his work is just absolutely inspiring. So if you wanna take a look at some breathtaking stuff, this is the place for you to go. Right, take a look at that, right? Beautiful, beautiful work. You're gonna see some more of Joe Busing. So I would tell you, just go take a look at that. Now, it's also time for a contest, but before I do, I wanna share with you guys our PeachBit ebook deal. So go to peachbit.com slash KelbyTV, and you're gonna be able to save 40% off the ebook, Sports Photography from Snapshot to Great Shots. This is gonna be a great book. If you wanna be able to take your sports photography to the next level, you can do this 40% off. This is a book that's normally $19.99 and you're going to get it for $13.99. Thanks to the folks over at Peach Pit for that. Now, contest time. Big contest. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to kelbytv.com. Over here, I want you to go to Photography Tips and Tricks. Under Photography Tips and Tricks, I want you to find this season ending episode. So go there at the bottom of that episode, right? So it's gonna be episode 36. Go all the way down to the bottom, all the way down to the bottom, all the way down to the bottom. All the way, there we go. Name, email, website, comments. Tell us what you like about the show. Tell us what you would like to see next season. All right, one of you guys is going to win the Epson R3000 printer. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal printer and I did a review on this not too long ago. It's a great, great printer. There's tons of information on the Epson website. You're gonna get some phenomenal pictures out of it. And if you wanna know more about that, here, I'm gonna leave you with this as well. Go over here, go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash R-C-R 3000. I did a giant review on the printer not too long ago. So if you wanna know more about the printer that you might be winning, you can do that as well. But one of you guys is going to win that. Now guys, I know you're watching this on YouTube and Google Plus and all of these other places. You have to go to episode 36 on the Kelby TV website to leave a comment to be able to qualify for this. So one of you guys will win that. Good luck to you guys. Now, this is the end of the season. So we're gonna take a break, we're gonna be off for a couple of weeks, but I would hope that during that time you come to this site and you tell us if there's something that you wanna see, leave it here, this is your show. We wanna solve your photography problems. And we thank you guys for coming by. We'll see you guys next season on Photography Tips and Tricks.